Lord God, we pray that you would proclaim your word to us. And Lord God, I ask that uh, you'd use me for that. But not just me. Lord, I pray that you would use memories from when we were three or four years old. That you'd use the painful uh, embarrassments that we went through this last week. You'd even use the grumpy feelings we had as we got ready for church this morning. That you'd use it all to preach your word to us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So uh, Romans, you know, is a book of the Bible. It's also a letter that we've been preaching through since uh, October. Um, get that out of the way. Uh, and uh, now it's almost February, this is our 12th sermon, and we're like in chapter 4, which means it might be easy for you to forget the things that Paul said just a few pages ago. So I want to remind you really quick and catch us up, okay? You remember that Paul started off by pointing out this fact that when we judge, we condemn ourselves. For we, the judges, do the very same thing uh, as those that we judge, and then he pointed out that on that day, God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ. That's Romans 2. So Jesus himself is the judgment on that day. Not simply that he judges. In fact, he said he doesn't judge in the book of John. Not simply that he judges or that he is judged, but that he is the judgment and then Paul talks as if that judgment were the entire point of world history. In fact, the entire point of all your transgressions and trespasses, human unrighteousness, that's Romans 3. And then he began talking as if the judgment had like somehow already happened or it, began, or it had come because he, he begins pronouncing all these judgments from the Old Testament. None is righteous, no, not one. No one seeks. That means none have faith. So the judgment is not what we think. That we make a bunch of decisions, then God judges those decisions, um, announcing that some are good decisions and some are bad decisions. It's more like God has already judged all our decisions and none are good. All are evil, but God's judgment isn't over, it's like still happening somehow. Then Paul made an utterly outrageous statement about all of us being condemned by law, that's the knowledge of good and evil written down like in, in a book, and all of us being justified by grace, that is declared right because we've been judged right because we are right, that's Romans 3.23. And now I know that all sounds kind of like maybe a bunch of psychobabble and incomprehensible nonsense. It sounds that way to us, and then Paul begins telling the story of Abraham, which to our ears sounds like more incomprehensible nonsense, psychobabble, and just plain old wishful thinking. So, so th this is the story of Abraham. When none is righteous, Paul's already said that. None, none is righteous. When none is righteous and no one seeks, God makes an outrageous, um, unconditional promise to an uncircumcised Gentile living in Syria named Abram. I will bless you, and in you, and in you, and, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. That's Genesis 12. I will, not if you believe, not if you obey, or even if you go, just, I will. In Canaan, then, next chapter, the word of the Lord comes to Abram, you know, like a walking, talking word, and delivers a promise. Your seed will be like the stars of heaven. That promise must have entered Abram's old body like a seed and taken root. For in the very next verse, Abram believes the word, and that belief, that faith, is reckoned as righteousness. 
because it is righteousness. So in a universe of unrighteousness, there is a seed of righteousness in Abram. A, a, a seed, for if we can believe Genesis 12 through 25, it's clear that Abram's belief, Abram's belief exists like in a vessel of unbelief, like a seed in a pot of broken, dirty soil, just a seed. <laughs> but it grows. So when Abram is 130 years old, at God's direction, he prepares to sacrifice his life, his love, his laughter, the promised blessing to the one that gave him the blessing in the first place. In other words, he trusts him. He prepares to sacrifice the blessing, but God sacrifices the blessing, and Abram, Abraham receives the blessing back and all things with him. Because you have done this, says God in Genesis 22, I will bless you, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed, and your seed will be like the stars of heaven because you've done this. So check this out. God made an unconditional promise to Abram, or Abraham, in Genesis 12, which was conditioned <laughs> upon Abraham's faith 50 years later after the promise, 50 years from when the promise had come to Abraham. Which means God lied in Genesis 12. Or, or, or God knew that he would create faith in Abraham with his promise, which itself was like the substance of things hoped for, like a seed. Because what is a seed? A seed is like a promise in flesh, right? It's a little like God saying to you, you will love me with all your heart, all your mind, and all your strength, and you will love your neighbor as yourself. That sounds like a promise. You will. And then God, through people, says stuff like this. He who loves is born of God and knows God, and he who does not love does not know God. Ah! So let's hope that the promise is like a seed. Yeah? Okay, so now we're caught up. Romans chapter 4, verse 20, where we left off last time. Uh, no unbelief made Abraham waver, literally, in the promise of God. But he grew strong. And then, dunumothe, Literally, this is a cool word, he was indynamited, indynamited. He was empowered in literally the faith, not his faith, Paul just writes the faith, in the faith as he gave glory to God. Abraham had a superpower. You know, you are blessed, even saved, if, if what God says is true in Genesis 22 because of what Abraham did on Mount Moriah. No, that's astonishing. In, in Jesus' story, salvation is described as sitting in Abraham's table or even resting in his bosom like Lazarus or Eliezer, his, his slave, former slave. Abraham had faith. So how's, how's your faith? Would you sacrifice your life and save the world or, or would you waver? Abraham had a superpower, and it was activated by or as faith. How's your superpower? Verse 20, no unbelief made him waver in the promise of God, but he grew strong in the faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. But the words that was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe upon him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up through our trespasses and raised through our justification. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, 
we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice, literally boast, in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice, we boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character. That's proven worth having like passed a test, tested character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, it does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So, we get all confused about this. What does faith look like? Well, number one, looks like Abraham, the father of faith, in whom all the families of the earth are blessed. He's like a superhuman being, a superman. And, here's another example, looks like Paul. You ever um, read uh, the book of Acts? Amazing stories in the book of Acts. In Philippi, Paul and Silas are thrown in prison. These are my favorite stories. They're beaten in stocks, they're in chains, and they start giving glory to God. They start rejoicing in their sufferings, which reveals their endurance and their proven character. And as they worship in hope, the earth shakes, prison doors fly open, they convert the jailer, and then they go on to evangelize Europe. Paul looks like Superman. I got Superman right here. He looks like Superman in the book of Acts. So do you look like Superman? Do you rejoice in your afflictions like Paul? Do you endure revealing proven character and unquenchable hope? Does the earth move when you worship. Have you even told your have you even told your next door neighbor that God is is love? Faith looks like Paul in the book of Acts. Faith looks like Abraham on top of Mount Moriah. Faith looks like Jesus on that very same mountain. And talk about rejoicing in affliction. On the cross, Jesus literally bears the sins of the world. He enters into all your afflictions, and yet in that place of profound unrighteousness, faithlessness, sorrow, and pain, he begins singing. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's the title of a song, Psalm 22, and the first line. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then the psalm goes on. God has not hidden his face from him, the psalm continues. All the families of the nations shall worship before you. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn that he has done it. It is finished is how the psalm ends. Look at him, high and lifted up. Look, look at him on the cross. Jesus rejoices in every affliction. He bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. He is the proven character of God Almighty. He dies and God raises him from the dead with superpower. He is literally the superman, the eschatos Adam in Paul's words, and he does not fail. But he accomplishes that for which he was sent. The word was sent, that's Isaiah 55. That's what faith looks like. And he said, greater works than these shall ye do. So, so do you. Do you rejoice in sufferings? Do you endure affliction, demonstrating the proven character of God? Do you worship in prison and suffering and afflictions? Do you evangelize the neighbors? Do you lay down your life on the holy mountain? If not, why? What's your excuse? Romans 2, 13, Acts 17, verse 31. God has fixed a day on which he will judge the world with a man. That's the eschatos, Adam, the Superman. Don't you realize that Jesus is the judgment of God? So how do you measure up? Now, don't go anywhere. Don't change that dial. Just sit. As if you were in a theater. Because I want to ask you a question. Where's your heart? My guess is that it's hiding in the trees, <laughs> covered in fig leaves. 
Or maybe for some of you, it's not hiding, it's hunting. It's hunting for me. To expose me, to humiliate me, to undress me, <laughs> and say, oh yeah, yeah, well, we're, we're, you don't rejoice in your afflictions, and when did you last talk to your neighbor about the love of God? What just happened to us? How did it go from good to bad so quickly? Well, God forbid, but I tempted you to judge yourself with the judgment of God. Now that would really be horrific, except that you do it to yourself and everyone around you like all the time, and you've done it most of your life. You don't really believe the judgment of God. But you judge yourself and others with the judgment of God and everything dies. So take, take, take a good look at the tree. Take another look at the tree. That's the judgment of God hanging on the tree. So just now we used him to judge and what just happened? <laughs> we left the garden and everyone began to hide. That's the promise of God hanging on that tree. But when we used him to judge, the promise turned into what? A threat. Not you will love, but you better love or else. That's the blessing of God hanging on that tree. But when we used him to judge, the blessing felt like a curse. Not you will inherit, but you're going to pay. That's the good in flesh hanging on that tree. But when we used him to judge, we came to know about evil. That's the life on that tree, and we crucified him. <laughs> That's the judgment of God. And now your head should be spinning a little bit because the judgment of God doesn't change. He's one, but you are two. And his judgment changes you. That's the Superman hanging on that tree. That's who you should be. And that is who you actually are. You see, there are two ways that we can relate to the judgment of God, which is Jesus, which is life and everything good, which is all that God is and all that God has created, including yourself. There are two ways that you can relate to everything. But for now, just think of Jesus on the tree in the garden on Mount Calvary. I can relate to the cross as the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And ironically, I think it is or at least it was. And I can relate to the cross as the tree of life. And it was. And it actually always is. I see the cross as the tree of the knowledge of good and evil when I listen to a voice that whispers, look at that. You can use that. You can use that to make yourself like God. And you see, that suggestion is more than a bit ironic. For in the very first chapter of Genesis, God claims to make me like himself. That's his judgment. But the voice whispers, take knowledge of the good. That's the good. Take knowledge of the good and make yourself like, like God. God alone is good and God in flesh is the man hanging on the tree. Perfect image of the invisible God. That's what scripture says. But the voice whispers, take, take, take knowledge of him and, and use him to judge yourself. And then justify yourself. You know, create yourself in the image of the creator. 
Apply him to yourself. Just like, you know, you apply a cheeseburger to yourself. Take him and eat him. Eat him. Now, I think, I, I think Paul has a name for the knowledge of good and evil taken from the tree. For, for, now, listen closely. There are different ways of obtaining knowledge, but I, I think Paul has, has a word for knowledge taken from the tree in order to justify yourself, and the word is law. Paul has already made the point that the Gentiles have this knowledge in their hearts. But he also refers to this knowledge written in books and given to the Israelites. As if God said, you want knowledge of good and evil? Well, here it is, written in stone. Now your hearts are stone. Well, when I listen to the tempter and I take fruit from the tree in order to justify myself, I learn about the good and I begin to judge myself as not good. That's evil. I judge myself as not good, for the good is the judgment of God, and I have just judged the judge and his judgment. So, as soon as I judge myself, I begin to condemn myself, and then in an effort to justify myself, I desperately begin to judge God and my my neighbor. For, For I figure, you know, maybe if God is wrong, then maybe I could be right, which is to create an illusion and trap myself in my own reality, for God's judgment is reality. And I figure if my neighbor is wrong, then I could be a little more right, which is to hate my neighbor and to choose to be alone in my own false reality. And then, I, I, once I catch a glimpse of what I'm doing, because you see the tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it works, it works. Once I catch a glimpse, I begin to grow angry. But the anger turns into despair, and I just want to die. And I can't die because I'm trapped within myself, by myself, my own illusion. And you see, we all do this like in just a moment without awareness of what it is that we're doing. For example, this last week, preparing for this sermon, I read Romans chapter 5, verse 3. We rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame. And I thought about Abraham on Mount Moriah. And I thought about Paul in the Philippian jail. And I thought of the Superman, high and lifted up on the tree in the garden on Mount Calvary. And then I thought about myself, and I thought, I suck. Shame. And then I thought, you know what? Maybe every sermon I preach is is a lie, especially the ones about joy. And then I thought, I hate preaching. Shortly after that, I received a note from a pastor who heard me in a podcast. He, he was a great guy. We talked on the phone, and he I remember he said, like, Peter, our stories are, like, just the same. But then he went on to mention how big his church was, and it seemed a bit bigger than mine. And then I was sad. And then I realized that I was sad because I wanted him to fail in order to feel better about me. And then I thought, shit, I'm like the devil incarnate. And then I thought, oh God, I want to die and I can't die, although it seems that everything is already dead. That's what happens when I judge the judgment of God before I let the judgment of God judge me. That's what happens when I use the judgment of God to judge others before I let the judgment of God judge me. That's what happened when the Jews and Pilate judged the judgment of God on the tree in the garden on Mount Calvary. And that's what happened when Adam and Eve took and ate the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil on the very same mountain. Now, now you may say, well, gosh, uh, Peter, Jesus now tells us to eat his body. He tells us to take and eat his body and drink his blood. Yeah, He does, doesn't he? That's worth thinking about. You may say, well, didn't God say don't eat of the fruit of the tree? Actually, he said you will not eat of the tree. And in the day you eat of the tree, dying you will die. (laughs) Well, that's something to 
think about quite a bit. We might ask, did God want us to eat of the tree? Do you realize that's just like asking, did God want us to crucify the Christ? The entire Old Testament just screams, it's wrong to crucify the Christ. And yet the whole Bible testifies this was the plan for the fullness of time. And God accomplishes all things according to the counsel of his will. Now we'll ponder all of that as we walk through Romans, but for now, I'm just pointing out that when I see the good on the tree as knowledge that I can use in order to justify myself, I then find myself trapped in death and unable to love. For you see, I just crucified love, and love is life. And eternal life is the commandment of God. Jesus says that in John 12. It's his judgment. So I crucified the life. That's called sin, and we've all sinned. It's already happened. We've already judged. We all judge, and we must all die and are dead. Now, most Christians have a rudimentary understanding of of that. So we have a rudimentary understanding of what Paul casually mentioned in our text at the end of chapter 4. Listen to this. Jesus our Lord was delivered up Paradothe, it's a fascinating word, also translated handed over or betrayed, which happens through Judas and happens through us and it happens through God and Jesus even gives himself up. He was delivered up for, through, or on account of our trespasses and raised for, through, or on account of our justification. We kind of get the first part. When we sin, we crucify Jesus. People get that. When we judge the judgment, we condemn ourselves. Some see that. When we break the body and take the blood, God forgives the body and bleeds the blood, we kind of get that. When we take knowledge of the good, we take the life, for Jesus is the life. Perhaps you are beginning to, to see that. When we try to make ourselves into the Superman with knowledge about the Superman, we don't become Superman, we become an old man. There's a whole lot to talk about there. We become an old Adam. Well, we kind of get the first part of Paul's statement. He was delivered up through our trespasses, transgressions. We get that. That's why Christians always sing such sad songs at communion. They, They go something like this. Oh, I suck. I killed Jesus. Now I'll try to pay you back. Although I cannot pay you back, so I'll just kind of be sad. At least I can be sad. Because he's super, and I'm not super. Teilhard de Chardin wrote this. Christianity does not ask us to live in the shadow of the cross, but in the fire of its creative action. So anyway, we kind of get the first part of Paul's statement. He was delivered up on account of our trespasses. But if we really got the second part of Paul's statement, he was raised on account of, through, by our justification. If we really and fully got that second part, that second part, I suspect that we'd always leave the communion table looking something a little more like like this. That was fun! That was so fun, I want to do it again! Boys, go! Yeah! Oh, it's When the wind stops, we can go for it again. Do you know that Superman gets his energy from the sun? Okay, I'm ready to go back. guy. 
Now, let's keep reading, but be before we do, let me remind you of something. I'm not saying that you should put on a red cape, run around the yard like two five-year-old boys and, and try to act all free because that's what Christians do. But that's not freedom. That's just making a new set of laws, right? You have to wear a red cape and blue spandex and act all free, which only creates a deeper deception and deeper bondage. It's self-righteousness and death. So I don't mean that. I mean something else, and I'd, I'd like to explain. You see, I think, I, I, I think the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is also the tree of life, and I also think that just as God says, there's seed in the fruit of the trees. Genesis 1, verse 11. And I think, as Jesus points out in John 12, seeds die. But they don't stay dead. So we've all sinned. We've all taken the fruit. That's already happened. And the fruit is working, for somewhere on our journey, we began to comprehend that God is the good. And so we have done great evil. And so we're dead and dying. We took the life, and in the words of Paul, we imprisoned him. This is a translation, Bart's translation. We imprisoned him in the chains of our own unrighteousness. The life is the promise, who is the blessing, who is the seed of Abraham. We ate the seed. But the seed sprouts in broken, dirty soil. The seed sprouts in the old stone temple that is your soul, and then you begin to believe. And when you come back to the tree and look to the throne, because Jesus is enthroned on the tree, according to John, you begin to see what has always been true. What you have taken has always been given. It's forgiven, be forgiven, and you are forgiven from the foundation of the world when and where the lamb was slain. And so listen closely. You actually do get the second part of Paul's statement. Or you wouldn't be here. In fact, I doubt you'd even be human you do get it. It's just that the you that gets it is about the size of a seed, a mustard seed, an imperishable seed, according to Peter, the promised seed. So you do rejoice in sufferings. You do endure a bit. You do have proven character and a hope that will not put you to shame. You just don't have much of it. It's like the size of a seed. So let's keep reading. Therefore, since we have been justified, have been, he says have been, have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we always stand in it, but now we have access. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope will not put us to shame. It will not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been, has been, listen all you Pentecostals, has been given to us. Now, none of that was in the imperative tense. That means that Paul is not telling you what you should do. He's telling you what you do do, what we do. For while we were so weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, that's be a person that has faith, though perhaps for a good person, one that, you know, kind of 
turned into some works. Well, one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, so listen closely, we've learned that we are justified by grace, we're justified by the faith of Jesus, we're justified by the resurrection of Jesus, and now the blood of Jesus. All the Old Testament says the life is in the blood. We have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath. Now, of God is added by the translator. So it could be God's anger, or it could also be my anger. I get pretty angry at God because he doesn't do what I say. Verse 10, for if while we were enemies, in fact, we crucified him, right? If while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, reconciled by the death, reconciled by the death. You know, we took the life right? We took the life, but Jesus brings the life back to the tree. Even as he brings us back to the tree, and he delivers it, peridothin, up on the tree, he surrenders, delivers up his spirit, hands over his spirit. He expires the spirit that we might inspire the spirit. That spirit is a spirit that rises in you. It rises in your blood saying, Abba, Daddy. When we cry, Abba, Father, it's the spirit himself bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then inheritors. That's Romans 8. Well, verse 10. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. So, <clears throat> according to Paul, we are justified, we are reconciled, and we are being saved. For God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Superman died for us. That's the show. He shows his love for us. That's the show. See, the universe really is like a theater. And why am I here? Why am I here in this theater? Able to hurt God and yet unable to help myself? Well, I'm here to observe the show. The love of God for me and for all of us. So why did those five-year-old boys dress like Superman and run around the yard? I bet it was not because someone said, you know, you should try to be Superman. I got some information, I got some facts here about Superman, some knowledge about Superman. You study these facts and then you really try hard to be uh, Superman, get to work. I bet it was not because someone said you should, I bet it was because they saw the show or they heard the story. You know, the law, that is the knowledge of good and evil, um, gained by, you know, taking fruit from, from the tree. The law is what? It's like a set of facts that, that you can use. In our world, through the empirical method, we have come to know billions and trillions and billions and trillions of facts, but we don't know what any of them mean. It's like someone crucified the meaning. Life is more than a set of facts. It's facts in a story that reveal the meaning. It's facts connected by the meaning. The cross is so much more than the knowledge of good and evil. I, I fear that we Western Christians think it's like, like simply the knowledge of good and evil. It's so much more than the knowledge of good and evil. It's also the tree of life, and it tells a story called the gospel, which is the story of the Superman, the word of God, the logos of God, the meaning of God, the plot. I bet those five-year-old boys heard the story, they watched the show, they lost themselves in the plot, and they found themselves playing along. So listen closely. People are made to recognize the good and imitate the good. Scientists have even shown that we're born with neurons, mirror neurons that are specific to that task. We look at the good and so imitate the good, not because we have to, but because we were made to, we long to. It's our birthright. 
Let us make Adam in our own image and likeness, the likeness of love. Maybe that's our birthright. You know, Superman didn't make himself super. His parents are aliens. They're from another world. Super, super is Superman's birthright. Well, I bet those boys watched the show, but not only in a theater. I bet they watched the show in a theater, and then they watched it in someone's eyes. Probably the eyes of their mom or, or dad, or as their mom or dad spoke a word, a word that they heard as a promise, not a threat. I bet they heard, you know what, buddy? <laughs> I think you're super. Yep, that's my judgment. And it's not going to change. I bet they heard a blessing. And I bet they saw Superman reflected in the eyes of that someone that loved them. With free and relentless love. The Bible calls that grace. And so they put on a cape. And they ran around the yard in hope. And so they called it play, not work. And they thought it was fun. They ran in hope, and that hope will not disappoint them. But as they get older, they will start to want, like we talked about last time. They'll start to want rather than hope, and that wantonness will make them take what has always been given. And that will lead to their humiliation until once again they return to the garden and once again they dare to hope, but now with a new knowledge. And in that hope, their humiliation will become an even greater exaltation for they will have learned to look into the eyes of their Father in heaven and they will not be disappointed or put to shame. And that is what you can barely even begin to believe. Because someone keeps whispering, it's just nice ideas. It's uh, psychobabble. It's wishful thinking. Pay attention, God is love, but also not love. And you better damn well believe you must justify yourself. You see, this, this is not just psychobabble. The reason sermons are complex sometimes is it's systematic theology. The the truth isn't complex. The lies are complex. It's systematic theology, and it's the word of God, which is the judgment of God, which is the promise of God. So listen, he was delivered up through our transgressions, and he was raised through our justification, and we are being saved by his life. On the cross, he cried, Father, forgive them. And he delivered up, he handed over his spirit. Forgive them. Who's he forgiving and what is he forgiving? He's forgiving all who took his life. And he is forgiving his life to you. Before giving his life. To you, giving his life to you. The life is in the blood, and even now it's rising from the dead in your veins as you listen to the word. Whose life? The life of the firstborn Son of God. He's giving you the birthright, and he is the heir of all things. That's his birthright. That's why he keeps asking you to drink his blood. Not to make you feel bad. I mean, oh, sure, you ought to say, sorry about killing you and everything. But, but you've already said that, right? It's not simply to make you feel bad, but that you would begin to live his life. He's given you his life that you would live his life and become his body. That you would look with his eyes into the eyes of his father and hear the promise. You are my beloved son. You're my beloved daughter, in whom I am well pleased. So go ahead, (laughs) put on the cape, start running around the yard. Sure, you might look like an idiot for a time, but you're gonna grow up and inherit all things. 
Verse 11, more than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. We rejoice, we worship. Abraham, this is what we read at the start, Abraham was strengthened in the faith, in dynamited, empowered, as he gave glory to God, as he worshiped. Those two little boys, they weren't trying to be Superman. They were rejoicing in the Superman, worshiping the Superman, and so becoming the Superman, his body at work in this world. So, so God doesn't tell you, you know, go to church and get more knowledge of good and evil so you can work really hard and apply it to your life. No, he tells you to stop. Shabbat. Listen to the story. Watch the show. Then drink his life so that you would begin to live his life and trust your superpower. So when you judge the judgment, everything dies. But when the judgment judges you, you begin to rise from the dead. The judgment is love. And love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love does not fail. Love is the promise. Listen, you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and you will love your neighbor as yourself. That's the promise, but because we took it as a responsibility, the promise became a threat. The blessing felt like a curse, and you lost the birthright, Adam. Love is the promise, love is the blessing, love is the birthright, and love in flesh is the seed. You know, the entire Old Testament is about the promised seed that will crush the head of the serpent. The seed is the promise and the blessing and the birthright, and people like Abraham try to, well, they try to create it when they don't trust it. People like Eliezer and Ishmael, they think that they're never going to get it. And people like Esau, they, they sell it. And people like Jacob, they steal it. And people like Jacob's children, they don't recognize it, and they even try to kill it. So in the end, there's only one that has it, and he is it. Jesus, the firstborn son of God. We all try to take it on a tree in a garden, and on that same tree in that same garden, he gives it to all of us. And he gives it to you. He gives his birthright to you when you least deserve it so you would know that he is good he's the good and you would begin to live his life the life of love and check this out love is writing this whole story he's the author and you know, that's a true superpower for every, every superhero that they are loved by the author. Each one is the apple of the author's eye. So absolutely everything in the story works for his or her good. When you take knowledge, that, well, that's why you never get stressed out in superhero movies. You know. Anyway, when you take knowledge from the tree to justify yourself, you see, you create a false self an old Adam, and to look at God with the eyes of that old Adam is instant destruction. For that self does not exist. God's not the author of lies. But when you return to the tree and see that God creates you, justifies you, and saves you with himself, which is his judgment, you then know because you've been known. You know because you've been known. You know that you are not just you, but you are Christ in you. That's how he makes you. You are Christ in you, and you in Christ, you are the body of Christ. And... If you look with those eyes into the eyes of God, you will see the image of the Superman reflected back at you, then give glory to God, then start running around the yard in hope, 
and become just who it is that you truly are. And so on the night that he was handed over, he took bread. And he said, this is my body given to you. Take and eat. In the morning, you're, yeah, you're going to take, but I'm giving it to you right now. I'm forgiving it to you before you could even take it. And in the same way, he took the cup, and he said, this is the covenant in my blood. Oh, the whole Old Testament is screaming. The life is in the blood. The life is in the blood. So he's not just forgiving you for taking his life. He's forgiving you his life that you might live his life, the Superman's life. So believe the gospel. Amen. So close your eyes. You know, the name of Jesus is not simply a fact. Do you know what the name Jesus means? You do, right? It means God is salvation. That's a story. Now, part of you believes that God is salvation. And part of you does not believe that God is salvation does not believe the judgment, which is to save. That part of you feels responsible for you. I want you to renounce that part of you. You don't need to fight it. You don't even need to hate it. You just need to see it for what it is. It's a lie. Oh, and God is not the author of lies. You are not the creator of you. You are not the savior of you. You are not the justifier of you. So renounce that part of you. Hand it over to Jesus. But there's also a part of you that, that trusts just a little. That maybe hopes just a bit that feels a little bit of love. Now find that part of you. It probably showed up at moments here and there. Find that part of you, even if it's only the size of a seed or a crumb of bread dipped in some wine. Find that part of you and from that part of you, so, so now you're in that part of you, from that part of you, listen to the word. You are my beloved in whom I am well pleased. I think you're super. And that opinion is uh, not going to change. If you'd like, you're free to put on a cape and run around the yard. Now believe the gospel 
in Jesus' name. Amen.